welcome, Emma. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Can you share a little bit about um, what it is that you do and, and how you got to where you are today? I can indeed. So I'm I'm sort of a TV, radio, podcast, broadcaster, I guess, in, in that sense of the word. And how did I get to where I did today? I guess I... I mean, many, many years ago, I used to bug the BBC by writing to them and asking them if they would, if they ever needed anybody on Saturday morning television. And eventually it paid off with a meeting with a producer who gave me my first break in TV um, doing cookery on a program called Going Live, which was a BBC flagship children's show. And that was really the starting point for me, I guess, of a career in that. That was my great passion. I'd done other things. I'd trained as a ballet dancer. I'd been in PR. I'd done all sorts of sort of extraordinary things. But live TV for me and live radio and live broadcasting was really my great passion. So I've sort of gone on quite a big journey, quite a few gaps in the middle with children and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, that's a little bit about how I got there. That's awesome. Um, and what made you want to do live TV and radio? Because for lots of people, I'm sure lots of people listening, they're like, that would be my worst nightmare. That sounds completely terrifying. I know. And it's and it's really funny you say that because actually, if you put me in front of people I know, I'm quite nervous. But for whatever reason, I find the adrenaline and sort of the rush that I get from doing something live and knowing that you've got like a, a one moment to do it in. I loved that feeling. I loved the feeling of live TV. And and to me, it was like, it was just sort of the excitement. It's all the team coming together. And it's this kind of, uh, yeah, to me, it's just exciting. But I'm not so good. I like doing it in front of strangers, but I'm not so good. If I, if I ever knew a member of my family was in the audience, I was always more nervous. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I heard the other yeah. day my dad said he watches my Instagram stories and I started to feel a bit strange about that. There's something... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I would, come out, I would come out what I call my nervous rash. I was always wearing like very high necks in clothing and, and it was because if I ever knew a member of family or somebody was there, I'd come out like in a sort of heat rash up my neck and the more I thought about it, because the more I'd think, oh, I know somebody in the audience, I know somebody in the audience, and the more this like redness on my neck would pulsate and then if somebody went oh your neck's gone red it would go like even through the roof so I yeah so I I don't know it's a it's a funny old thing that I just I don't know I find it just it was just exhilarating I just loved it that's brilliant that's brilliant and it's horrible I've, I've worked with clients who've had things like that where they get red you know red kind of patches on their skin from presenting or something and it's a horrible thing because you can't hide that. You can't, like, you can hide your nerves. No. So you can't hide if it's a very physical manifestation of that. No, you can't. And also, um, if it crept up my neck, there was this lovely makeup artist and she bought this like green makeup. There's a sort of green makeup you can use. But actually, I looked at myself one day, I said, it just makes you look ill and with a nervous rash, if you know what I mean. So you look green. I looked green. You just did get this green tinge to you. I was like, no. And so funnily enough, just wearing high neck clothing, the thought that I'd got it covered, made it less. It was a sort of psychological thing for me. If I covered it up, I was less worried about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was curious to know, whereabouts are you in the world right now? Um, yeah, good can you tell us question. About that? <laughs> I'm on the East Coast of America and I, um, I was living right in the middle of Manhattan uh, the last three years. But uh, almost a year ago, we came out with the prospect of this sort of unknown quantity COVID-19 and and it, we've got a weekend house out in Long Island that we'd come to for long you know for long weekends and we've been here a year <laughs> and we moved out and I, I I haven't left it basically and I've been here a year I've seen all four seasons um come and go and yeah we've just been here for the whole of this whole extraordinary pandemic yeah. And how, how's that been for you? What has the last year been like for you personally? I would say I'll sort of put it on, on the good bits and the bad bits. On the upside, um, part of the reason I moved to America is that I have a child on each coast, a grown up child on each coast, and I hated being that far away from them. And my husband and I, because he had work here anyway, we decided to, and we loved America. We thought we'll do the big move. And we'll spend part two of our lives in America. And of course, at that point, you know, travel getting back to family and stuff was easy. 
Um, and so we moved here three years ago. And so this pandemic, you know, it was the good bit was that I was near my two children. And if, so my son actually came and has spent a lot of lockdown on this coast with us because he's the one on the West Coast. And as my kids said, I got everything I loved. I had two grown up kids move back home, which for me was heaven because I slept better. I could switch off the phone. I didn't worry where anybody was. And I have relished that time. Um, and there's bits of it that I've loved. It's taught me to slow down. It's taught me what kind of life I like to lead, all sorts of things. But on the other hand, I've been separated from my family, which I've never been forcibly separated from my family. Um, and I've always been able to get back to them. So I haven't seen my mum for a year and a half, which is really tough. And my sister, um, four months ago, got diagnosed with cancer and I wasn't able to go back to her either. So I would say it's been challenging on many fronts and and I and a bit of a roller coaster you know I'm quite an anxious person and I think that uh COVID has sort of played to everybody's um strengths but it's also played to everybody's weaknesses and and so that the, the good has been good but the but the bad has been bad you know it's it's a it's a roller coaster yeah yeah absolutely can you share a bit more about your experience with anxiety and what, what that's been like for you? And what's the history of that? I mean, did you have anxiety when you were younger? Um, yes. I mean, it's funny, really. I don't know how far it went back. Um, other than I know that I used to hate my mother going out for dinner and I'd write her notes and all the rest of it. So I guess I must have been anxious to a degree about that if I was sort of, you know, really going back in time. But I think it, it really was triggered by, after I had my daughter, I had sort of undiagnosed postnatal depression and it took the form of feeling massively overwhelmed. Like my sense of responsibility, I just thought I have to keep this person alive and I have to do it single-handedly. And it's a job I don't, I'm not sure I know how to do it. I, I felt very, you know, I was on the crest of a wave career-wise and it was something that every, everybody was sort of like, oh my God, you'll be so fine. And you'll know when she's hungry and you'll know this and you'll know that. And I was I was always quite worried. I always thought, oh my God, I don't know if she is crying because she's hungry or she's got a temperature or, you know. So I think it was triggered by that. I then had it sort of diagnosed after my son. And again, it took the form of just feeling overwhelmed. And if people have ever followed my career, I, I took a real step back from my career because I basically... I couldn't do the career mother juggle. It was too much for me. I couldn't bear not being with my kids. And that's not a criticism on people that stay at home with their children or people that go back to work. I'm just talking about my own personal journey. I was just like, I've had them. I want to be with them. And I couldn't handle, I, I became much more selective about work. I didn't want to go away for the night. I didn't want to be away from them. So I became, you know, a full-time mum and loved it. But I think over the years, I think my anxiety has taken sort of funny little forms. And I guess really moving abroad and having my children one on each coast, I think it sort of came from sort of being all over the place as opposed to having, when you've got children who are at school and you all live in the same country, you've got regular things in your diary. You've got two weeks of Easter holidays. You know where everybody is and there was a routine to my life. And I think it was when I sort of, slightly went more into free fall that my anxieties got bigger right yeah yeah I, I, I had a few um people who are parents on the podcast recently and a lot of people will say that their anxiety after they have children it's just that responsibility and the, the stakes somehow seem so much higher and the lack of sleep and all those things can really have such a have such a toll yeah I think I think they do I think they take a toll on one and I think you know, we strive, I think, as, as as working parents for perfection. You know, I wanted to get it right. I wanted to do the right thing. And, and I wanted to sort of tick all the boxes. And I sort of wanted to be able to do it all. And I think we can't. And, you know, it's quite difficult to achieve everything. And and it's the sort of realisation of that and, and putting your sort of expectations in the right order, I guess. Um, and were there things that helped you, you know, when you've had those anxious periods in your life? What sort of things have you tried? What helped you? The things that you tried um, that didn't help at all? 
I sort of tried lots of things. I mean, I was offered, initially I was offered Prozac and I never went on any medication. I was very, and again, no judgment here, but I was very adamant that I didn't want to go on any kind of medication. I wanted to be able to conquer it myself. That was my sort of, and always is really, I always feel like I want to conquer it. And I have tried lots of things and I do have a lot of coping mechanisms. Um that I've sort of learned along the way and that I do and whether that's sort of amazing breathing techniques or, you know, taking a bit of time out. I learned how to do um, medit- transcendental meditation and I found that helpful for a while. And I think what I've learned is it sort of, it sort of depends on the level of anxiety and I've got things that I can do. I've now got a dog. So for instance, I love to go out and go for a walk with the dog. Um, And that's a very good thing for me with my anxiety. It's a really good thing for me to do. I've tried to have a better, and actually lockdown did that, a better sleep routine, you know, a proper nighttime routine of unwinding and not watching, which I used to do. And I was living in Manhattan, don't forget, which is what was noisy and sirens. And I'd get into bed and I'd sort of go to bed watching the news or something sort of high powered. And actually lockdown made me go, actually, I probably need more of a, a bath, relaxing, reading a book or listening to music or doing something like that. So I've tried all sorts of different things. I've had therapy, I've done, you know, tapping, I've done lots of things. And 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 I find now that basically what I've got is quite a good toolbox of things that I can go back in and kind of think, actually, this works for me in that moment. And then I can, you know, the next time I go, well, it doesn't work as well. And then I find something else. So I, I keep looking and changing for things, to be honest. And I would say I'm much better at coping with it. But I think I'm much better at realizing that it's nothing to be ashamed of. And actually that it's much better to just be very open about being anxious because so many people are. And I just think, you know, it's not something we have to hide. It's not a failure. It's just part of my DNA is that I think I'm just much more of an anxious person. Mm, Yeah. I think what you say there about having a toolkit and having different things that you try and you you're open to trying different things and maybe for some for some time in your life you try the tapping it works and then you try another time it doesn't work but I think sometimes we yeah having that openness to trying things and yes having that toolkit is really important yeah I think so I think it's good to to have different things to try because you know, things that work for some people don't work in other. And sometimes it's location. Like when I learned transcendental meditation, we were on the West Coast. I was in sunshine. It was sort of perfect. You know what I mean? It's like the perfect place to learn meditation. And I was like, oh, this is heaven. I'm going to be so dedicated. I'm going to do this 20 minutes in the morning and I'm going to start my day like this. And then we got back to New York, which is like noisy and sirens and everything kind of coming and going. And I was so cross because I thought, now I can't do meditation. Now I'm just cross about doing meditation because it just didn't work so sometimes you have to I think you have to give yourself a break that it doesn't always work in the right in the same place and it doesn't and it doesn't matter I sort of stopped that but when I'm in the right place if I'm on holiday it's a really nice place to do it um if I'm not I find it really hard some people are able to do that I found yoga's really good um yeah so I sort of I I sort of mix it up all the time but I'm always open to new things like I'm I'm quite keen on hearing what the new thing is and then I think oh maybe I'll try that and if if I fancy trying it I do and sometimes it really works Yeah yeah I love that Yeah I'm a I'm a sucker for any kind of workshop like sound healing <laughs> cacao the only thing I've stopped doing is I, I said to somebody the other day I was such a sort of self-help book purchaser and I would see a title and I think oh that's perfect you know how to quiet your mind anxiety you know and I got sort of every title and all I did was never really read them I just bought them they made me feel better by sort of having all these books but then I thought actually a lot of the time you'd read them and you're a bit like oh I can't do that by chapter one and then it almost puts you off it so I I don't buy as many books on stuff like that anymore. I tend to try and do the more practical things than reading about it. But that's just me. I mean, I, I hear that a lot actually from from uh, people that I speak to that they have, you know, a shelf a shelf full of self help books, but don't actually put it into practice because it's quite that hard, is. I think, to to read a book and then with your under your own steam kind of do all the exercises. I think sometimes we need well, a bit I think more it's supervision. Quite hard. Yeah, it's quite hard to be motivated. And I always found with anxiety books that they always started with kind of with that period in the morning when you wake up 
they always have that, you know, take 10 minutes to yourself, and whether it be to meditate or listen to music or make yourself a cup of tea. And I thought, but I've got a dog. My first 10 minutes are that I have to get him up and out to pee. <laughs> and so I never have that. So it's sort of, it, it's frustrating because you can't necessarily always adapt those things to your own life. So I've, I've had to sort of, you know, you, you have to make it work for you and not feel bad that that method doesn't work because no, no one thing could fit everybody. Yeah, exactly. And I think as well, it's important that we don't beat ourselves up about, about these things. You know, if we can't, yes. if people have got young children, you're not going to have 20 minutes in the morning to like drink a lemon water necessarily. Or, <laughs> no, um, no. So don't, yeah, let's not beat ourselves up about those things and find things that work for us, I think, instead. I think so. And I think I've become a bit more realistic about it. You know, I think I've sort of just with age and I guess as well with COVID, it sort of made one reflect a lot more on all of that and, and go, okay, what's achievable? What can I change in my life? What can I, you know, do? And I guess I never really, I didn't stop much. I was a real doer. And I think part of my coping mechanism was to keep going, just constantly keep going, keep going, keep going. And actually by stopping, that's probably been quite good for me, weirdly. Although, you know, obviously COVID is an anxiety provoking situation, but, um, but the actual lockdown element of it was probably quite good for me. Yeah. I wonder if lots of people are recognising that, that they just potentially, you know, before lockdown have been kind of just keeping busy all the time and maybe just keeping everything uh, suppressed. And then sometimes when we slow down, things can come kind of come up to the surface, I think. And yeah, as I we're confronted so. with I you know, I think, but as I say, I think it's made, I think it's sort of gone every which way. I mean, I think everybody's kept quite quiet, but I'm sure all the mental health situations are going to, you know, I think they've been really tested in this time. And I think that, you know, I think it could go either way. You could either stop and then realise that your situation was sort of super bad and, and, and it could really heighten anxiety, or you could kind of go, actually, I now see the reasons why I was anxious because I've got the time to recognize it and 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 potentially have time to to deal with it more and to find more ways to to sort it. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about you know your career presenting and, and speaking on TV and interviewing people. You've interviewed people, casual people like Michael Caine, Roger Moore, <laughs> Richard Gere, no less. Um, yes, sat around yes. the table with with Elton John and David Attenborough. <laughs> what was that like for you at the time to to, to be interviewing those I, I mean, it was amazing, really. I mean, I, you said Richard Gere. I use that word loosely because he is the only person actually ever that genuinely left me speechless. I and and I was working with Andy Peters at the time, and I was meant to interview him at a premiere um, of a cartoon. I think it was Pocahontas or something, and he. It was for his charity and he appeared at Leicester Square. And so it was this big interview I was going to get with Richard Gere. And he arrived. And, and because I was interviewing sort of out and about, you could hear the paparazzi and people screaming for him. And I got really caught up in it big time, you know, like big time. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I ran after him and <laughs> the microphone. And when I got to him, I just went, hi. And he stopped and said, Hi. And I never spoke again. And Andy used to give me such grief. He go, oh, that in-depth interview that Emma did. I mean, I, I literally, I don't think I spoke, I don't think I said anything to him. So he was probably the only person that left me tongue-tied. Everybody else, I I just was super lucky. I just, I loved it. You know, I just got to interview these incredible people, um, some of whom, you know, aren't even around anymore. And which is, you know, sort of a great privilege to have, have interviewed like Roger Moore and people like that. And And I think... You know, it's part of the job, but it was never not exciting. You know, it was never not a kind of highlight of my job to interview somebody of that ilk, whether they be in the music industry or film industry or like David Attenborough, anybody like that. It was always, a tra and it still is, you know, that's part of what I love doing is I love interviewing people and hearing about them. It's just, it's just a great joy of the job, really. The one, the one celebrity that I've met in my life is Richard Gere, and I met him on a Buddhist like retreat in India. Oh yeah. He's a, he's a big Buddhist, I think. I think that still right. was at least this is probably about twelve years ago. And uh yeah, just said hello and uh <laughs> walked past in the corridor at the Buddhist retreat. So that's like the one 
<laughs> so you only said hello to him as well. Yeah. He leaves everybody speechless because <laughs> he's just, you can't get away from that kind of pretty woman. Like no. I just, I was just, I was completely overwhelmed by Richard Gere. I do actually think to this day, I'd probably still be speechless if I saw Richard Gere. There's something about him. Very few people leave me like that, but he's one of them. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember watching Pretty Woman when I was probably too young to watch it, like nine or something. It left a very big impression on me. So yeah, I think it did with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, I mean, do you have advice for people who who would love to feel more confident when talking to people who who look at presenters and think I, I could never do that. I can't even speak up on the team meeting in Zoom, um, let alone you know interview someone famous you know do, do you have any advice or what, what would you say to people who are struggling yeah I with think that? it's it's I think my advice would be it just is that I think some of the best some of the best advice I ever got when I was starting out was from Sarah Green who I took over on from on going live is another amazing broadcaster and when I first started I said to you know what advice are you going to give me and she said just remember to breathe and I thought, what a ridiculous piece of advice. If I don't breathe, I'm going to kind of die. I was like, okay. I thought, well, I thought I could get bigger advice than that. But it's such a true thing. When we're nervous, the biggest thing we stop doing is, is, is stopping breathing. And I remember when I looked back at my first show that I did live, I speak like one of those fast speakers that win competitions. I never took a breath. She was completely right. I just didn't stop to breathe because I think our nerves take over and we think, if we talk faster and we fill the air and we don't pause and we don't stop, that sort of gains it. Or, as you say, people go the opposite direction and just think about being silent. And I think the best advice I have is just try to think of it as having a conversation with somebody because you're not nervous when you're having a conversation with somebody and, and you don't just have conversations in life with people that you know. You have you have conversations with somebody in a shop or somebody you meet in a queue or somebody you're sitting next to in the cinema or whatever it is or a doctor, whatever it is, you have a conversation with them. And I think the key is just to remember to, to breathe and to remember that actually if you can sort of get past thinking about it as sort of, oh my God, I'm in front of masses of people. My husband sometimes had to do public speaking and he's not in my world. And I said to him, if you're really nervous and you've got to stand up and speak in front of people, if you take your eye line just slightly above people's heads, they think you're looking at them, but you're just looking past them because it's it's the it's the taking of eye contact that makes people nervous. They think, oh my God, all eyes are on me. All eyes are on me. And if you can just take your glance a fraction to another direction, you'd be staggered how it takes away the nerves because you're not actually looking at somebody. Does that make sense? I don't know if it does or not, but it's just just a slight thing, just until you get over it, because the minute you start to relax, then you realise that you can make eye contact with people and you can think, oh, that person looks a bit, you know, bored or not interested and you can move your head somewhere else. And So it's important to just sort of keep moving, keep moving your head, not get static and fixated and sort of just just think to yourself, I'm just talking to one person. I'm literally just talking to one person. I mean, it's probably easier said than done. And I, it's a funny thing with presenting because I do think there is a, there's a knack to it because you're not being an actress. You're being, it's so funny when people meet me and they go, you're just like you are off camera, like you are on camera. And I go, well, that's because I'm a presenter because if I wasn't, I'd be an actress. Like that's a completely different thing. You hope that people are exactly the same when they're not presenting as they are when they're presenting because you're kind of the same, you're the same person. You're just having a conversation and you're facilitating that conversation. So I think just being yourself is, is just a really important part. And I actually think that now more than ever, authenticity is what people like. I think people really like people to just be themselves. I think social media gave people such a platform to not be themselves. But, but I actually think people now have changed. And I think actually COVID was quite a turning point in that, actually. I think people have craved authenticity more because we can't, we've all been in something together. It's a very unifying thing. And I just think people are just like, you, you, you couldn't make lockdown, but people did try, look glamorous. Do you know what I mean? You couldn't kind of go, you, you, people tried in the beginning. I remember on social media in like the first two weeks and people going, another cozy night in and it was sort of rose petals in the bath. I was like, honestly, no, <laughs> this is not real life. We're ne- this is never going to last. You know, yeah. ooh, another cozy night, pizza for two and all this sort of thing. And then the reality hit. And I think actually it's been quite a good thing because I think people feel much more that everybody's sort of 
everybody suffers the same. Everybody has issues of their own. They may be to different degrees, but everybody is kind of unified in that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and I wonder, yeah, how I suppose there's a lot of backlash at the moment about influencers who are um, going going on yeah. holiday to Dubai and taking pictures and trying to... <laughs> Yeah, I guess they've got to earn their living, but at the same time, yeah. Well, I know, and I think it's, you know, it's obviously controversial and it's obviously, and I'm not remotely kind of political, but it is difficult. You know, I mean, it is, it's a, it's a tough one because to see that on, I guess because everybody is in the same boat to whatever degree, if somebody is in, and I, I can speak from my own personal experience, I see somebody in Dubai without a mask on holiday, you're just like, how is that? It's almost like living on a parallel universe. I had to text one of my friends, like, where are you? That this is like not happening because mm. I can't go and get a cup of coffee without a mask. So where are you that this is okay? And I guess it's, yeah, I think that's, I think that's been quite tricky for people. Yeah. I suppose in New Zealand, they've, they've got a good situation now. They have a music festival. My friend uh, is, is from New Zealand. She's there right now and she, she went to a music festival and no, because they, they've done they it right. barely they've had done any right. cases. They yeah, did, because I think right. they shut it down, didn't they, yeah. sort of instantly, and they've had, like, no cases. Mm. I know. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah, it's interesting what you were saying about the public speaking and not breathing. And I, I used to really struggle with public speaking, and I remember speaking so fast, hoping that I would just get it over and done with, and then eventually, <laughs> yes. like, you have to, like, take a breath and you, like, gasp for air, and that's not a good, that's not a good look. Um, I know, and it's yeah, also just, that thing of, we're scared to pause because we think, oh my God, if we pause, people will think there's something wrong. Or, but, but actually, it's very interesting. When people pause in an interview, it just makes you look like you're thinking. It's like actually quite a good tool to do that. And and I know that when I used to do Saturday morning television, if we hadn't caught, we used to interview a lot of soap opera people. And if we hadn't, you know, watched every single episode, you know, our tactic was, you would just pause at the beginning of the interview and you'd go, wow, what a week you've had. And they would go, I know, can you believe, you know, I shot so-and-so and I did, you know, on the soap opera. And it's sort of, it, you can pause to quite good effect is what I'm saying. It doesn't always mean that you have to panic. You can pause and it can be a good pause. Yeah, I think, yeah, pauses can be very powerful. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be an awkward silence then. It can no. be adding kind of gravitas and, and yes, some exactly. drama or meaning to something. Yeah. Exactly. Can you tell us about your podcast? So you've got an amazing podcast. I've been having a listen. Um, Life yeah. And Soul. Can you share about that? And what made you want to start that uh, podcast? I can indeed. Well, I wanted to you know, lockdown was a sort of, a, you know, obviously for everybody, a period of time being at home. And I and I really missed working. And I'd, I'd been trying to sort of get something off the ground, but life had sort of taken over. And so this gave the perfect opportunity. And I thought, well, I'll call it Life and Soul. And I'll chat to people about what gives them life, what feeds their soul. And I'll just see where it takes me. And I'll just sort of, and I wanted to do, I've got a website alongside it, which I wanted to make like a toolbox in every sense of the word so that you could look to it. I've sort of supported small businesses. I've got lists of small businesses that people all gift guides, but I've also got sort of words from experts, Q and A's with experts. And I wanted the chat to be very informal, but but to really get sort of to the nitty gritty with people. And actually, initially we were like, well, maybe we won't talk to everybody about lockdown because, you know, that's probably just a passing thing because it's just the most prevalent subject and you can't get away from it. And actually it's been great because what you realise is that people are really keen to talk. They really, you know, they're in lockdown. It's been super tough. And so people really have thought about what gives them life and what feeds their soul big time. So I was sort of handed it on a plate really in terms of subject matter so I've loved it. I've been able, because people aren't coming on, they don't, I mean, they may have a book out and we may talk about that sort of as a by the by, but I'm not sort of on it as a sort of promotional thing. I'm more just chatting to people about stuff that that, that other people might not know about. Yeah, that really comes across. It definitely feels like a, a cosy chat um, <laughs> yes. when you listen to it. Are there things that you've learned from that podcast from your guests? What are the things that have kind of emerged that have sort of, sort of stood out to you so far? I think I've learned a lot, actually, because each person I speak to has been such an it's been such an education or an eye opener. I mean, Julie Walters, 
who I started with, who I'm a huge fan of. She was amazing because she's just, you know, recovered from bowel cancer. And she was really super open about talking of all of that which, and funny, which, of course, she's known for being funny. But she was also really honest. She just said, you know, when I was diagnosed, I thought, phew, I've got a reason to stop work for a bit. Because she said that working, she was always working in anxiety. And I thought, oh, that's real really interesting because you never see that. Obviously, you see her as this consummate professional, but actually it was giving her high anxiety and she was saying how much she was enjoying time out. And so, you know, I learned that from her. I've spoken to some incredible people in the medical field. And then I had a, I've interviewed, it hasn't come out yet, but I interviewed Jay Rayner, the, the food critic, um, recently on The Telegraph. And he was like, I'm really against all this wellness guru thing. And I learned so much from him because I said, no, I'm keen to kind of know why. And he said, because who wants to have illness as a word? Everybody wants to have wellness. But like there's a really big divide if you keep saying, if you drink this green juice, you know, you will be healthy. You will boost your immune. And I suddenly felt really, I was like, no, you're so right. Like I need to be more aware of that. So everybody's kind of given me something that I take away, whether it be a bit of advice or just that I've had a really lovely laugh with them. This week, I've got John Barrowman on, who's a really old friend. We had such a lovely chat. And he was super honest about having to have therapy in for his anxiety during lockdown. And so I think there's been an honesty to it that I've just adored. And as I say, every single person I've spoken to, I've sort of come away with a little gem or a little nugget of something, whether it be information or advice or something I hadn't heard of. So it's partly why I love doing it. It's like having sort of permanent therapy through other people, <laughs> <laughs> learning on the job. Yeah, I think podcasts are a bit like therapy. Um, yeah, they are. Both for the people doing the interviews and being interviewed sometimes. And also I think that people listening often tell me that they feel like I'm getting a sort of therapy session through, through kind of hearing on Yeah, I think podcasts, I mean, I was very late to the podcast game, but I, I, you know, now that I listen to people and I love like this woman I hear, I love Brene Brown and people like that. I, I really find it, a, it's a very good medium and it sort of ticks the boxes for me because it's like doing live TV. I just do it in one take. I don't record it or edit, you know, we just do it as a conversation. I, I do it in vision so I can chat to somebody without a mask and physically see them, which I find much more appealing than down the phone. And and I think podcasts are nice because I think they give people company. It's just like having company in your car or on a walk. You can do it in your own time and you can dip in and out. And again, it's that sort of toolbox effect. You can sort of pick and choose. You can go, oh, I'll listen to that one because that's about that. Or I can listen to that because it's got a little bit about this or that's just a celebrity that I love. And so I think it's, I think it's a really appealing form of um, media. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you so much for everything that you shared today. It's been oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Um, Anytime. Where can, where can people find out more about you? And um, I'm sure your podcast is in all the usual spots. But um, So my podcast is on all the, it. yes, it's on all the usual podcast, you know, slots like Spotify and iTunes and everything. And my website is byemma.co. And you can go to the website there and you can listen to the podcast through the website as well. So, um, and I'm on Instagram, um, which is at Emma Forbes Lifestyle. And I've got an at by Emma.Forbes Instagram as well. So I sort of, I, I run the two at the same time. And I was watching your Instagram stories the other day and you're making something delicious. You're making overnight oats. You have lots of different things on your uh, Instagram like that little... Yes, I try to, I, I basically, because I have my son home for a lot of lockdown and he's much more technical than me. I made him my cameraman. And so I started to do, I'm about to do lockdown leftover dinners and things. And and, and I just do little cookery things as and when, when the moment takes me. But yes, the most recent one was overnight oats, which people seem to like, because I'm always, I'm quite a haphazard cook. So I post something like I've posted a recipe tonight. But I don't put the recipe because I kind of throw it all together and then I get all these messages going, what's the recipe? What's the recipe? So I need to remember to sort of do that um, and write the ingredients up afterwards. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. It's a Thank pleasure. You.